from God's Unchanging Word Studios in New Orleans. We are pleased to bring you news, nuggets, and insights with today's host, Tom Carey. Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to God's Unchanging Word and another edition for our news, nuggets, and insights. And today is August 30th, 2019, Labor Day weekend, in case you didn't know about it. A lot of you will be spending some time home with your family and away from work. And we've got a great little video. We'll be talking about that at our midway point in the program. But let's get right to the news to begin with. Let's begin with talking about a multi-faith religious community being set up by the Pope. He's at it again as he continues to expand his outreach into the world. Then we're going to talk about the rainforest. You've probably heard about this. This got some, I'm going to bring an interesting nuggets portion into this with this part of the program. And we've been waiting for this. This is a catalyst. This is like a next stage of things that had to take place before the return of Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk to you about that when we get there. And then we're going to talk about the appointed time, part two, in our series of, of appointed times in the return of Jesus Christ. And talking about what the Bible says and what he has for. So now let's get right into the information. But as always, we want to begin with a little short stories first. California, as always. In fact, it's not a week that goes by we couldn't bring California in for something. This time it's rebranding criminal IDs and the growing health problems of the homeless. Kind of like these two seem like they kind of fit together. San Francisco liberals respond to the rising crime. It's amazing uh, how the dummying down of everything seems to rise everything else up in evil and filth. And that's what's going on out in California. So now what they're doing is they're renaming the convicted felons to justice involved person. Makes sense, right? Well, we'll talk about that. San Francisco Board of Supervisors decided the best way to combat rising crime is to in integrate criminals back into society is to rebrand them. So let's not call what it is where God says, let yea be yea, you nay be nay. Let's just revamp everything instead of telling people for what is really going on. The city is suffering from the highest crime rates in the country, but in the mind of the politically correct left, the important thing is to soften the language applying to the offenders. Crime-ridden San Francisco, this is from a headline. Crime-ridden San Francisco has introduced a new sanitized language for criminals, getting rid of such words as offender or addict, in which changes convicted felon to a justice-involved person or a formerly incarcerated person. And I love this one. He's a returning resident. Didn't that kind of make you feel so kind of warm and fuzzy? You know, got a convicted felon. Who knows what he did? But it's, he's just returning home. So I'm glad to have him back. How about this? Juvenile delinquents will now be called young person with a justice system involvement. Well, that simplified everything. And a young person impacted by the juvenile justice system. I don't know. I mean, so... This is what they're spending their time on while they have this going on. The homeless and the health problems that's continuing to grow out in California. Look at the expanding homelessness. <clears throat> this is just L.A. County alone. And then across America, it's growing not as fast as California, but it's growing all across the country. We're seeing the foundation in the middle of an economic boom. We're seeing an economic deplorable state of our country continuing to expand week by week. So now, with the homeless, what else comes with the homeless? Sanitation and health issues. Now, you've probably seen all this on the news. Right, we've, we've been covering about it ourselves, and I love this. Skid Row, city limit, <laughs> too many, too many in Skid Row. But now what we're seeing is the foundation for sickness and disease beginning to swell the streets and into the community itself, going into buildings where they've seen, seen the rat infestation in, in 10th and 11th story buildings. They're seeing it, and believe it or not, this is an actual picture from a restaurant where a dead rat just fell out the ceiling on somebody's table. <clears throat> That's been reported in the news also. What it's doing is bringing back medieval diseases that we once thought were eradicated. All right, we got a video. I'm going to show you this video, and we'll be right back to talk about that in just a second. <laughs> Rodents scurrying throughout L.A. City Hall. A legion of rats patrolling the sidewalks just outside of it. 
rats falling from the ceiling at a Westchester Buffalo Wild Wings, and typhus outbreaks at City Hall and LAPD. Angelinos have long known LA's rodent problem has only been getting worse, and a brand new study confirms it. Thank you for coming out today and to the city of angels, but unfortunately it has become the city of rats. At a press conference at City Hall Tuesday afternoon, the taxpayer advocacy group Reform California released a study they commissioned on the rodent crisis. This report should be a shame on local government officials who've known about this crisis for the past several months, but have tried to sweep it under the rug, along with the rat droppings. The study surveyed almost two dozen pest control companies in California and found that all of them reported rat service requests were up almost 60 percent in just the last year. The study found that California is suffering from a massive explosion of the rodent population for two specific reasons. First, the homeless population increase, which provides a source of food which supports population growth. Second, many local governments, including Los Angeles, have banned the most effective practices for detecting and eradicating rats. And pest control companies say their hands are tied. The professional pest control industry has gone to Sacramento. We've explained it as professionals to committees that we, the professionals, know how to help you. You license us, you regulate us, but now you don't listen to us. The study found the rodents are directly linked to the recent typhus outbreaks here in L.A. Typhus has not been seen at this level in modern history. And downtown L.A. is ground zero. Rat traps can be found all over the outskirts of City Hall. The homeless and transient populations here have exploded, and the rodents make themselves at home as soon as the sun goes down. If politicians want to try to deny that we have a rat epidemic, then they need to put their money where their mouth is, and and they should be willing to resign their seat in office if even one more person contracts typhus and it's tied back to a rat infestation. They won't make that bargain because they know exactly what's going on. When you you look at what's going on, it's almost like pre-World War II where the enemy would bring in what they call sleeper agents and they would sit dormant in the country waiting to strike when the time was opportune. It's almost like that with these diseases now. What we're looking at is that they're, they're coming to the surface again and they're sitting very dormant in certain areas. When these diseases begin to grow and there's no millions of dollars to throw out there to stop them, they're going to begin to grow random, just rapidly all across this nation and you're not going to be able to stop and get a hold of it because there'll be no funds to do it. They're spending millions of dollars in that area and they're making no progress for the homelessness, for the sick, and for the disease that's growing rampant now, that's in the middle of all that, that mess that you see right here. It's just, it just growing over and over and over. And the Bible warns that during the period of time, in the time of the seals that's coming upon us, these diseases will get out of control and we begin to take many people's lives. You're looking at the foundation coming right now and nobody is able to stop it. All right, so now let's move on. Let's talk about now the multi-faith committee set up by the Pope. We're talking about religious reform. This is the news of the committee's formation was announced by the Emirates. That's the United Arab Emirates people in the news agency. It was confirmed by the Vatican. Now, so what's going on here? This multi-faith committee has set out to spread Pope Francis's claim that God wills the diversity of religions. So what are we looking at? All right, I'm going to show you, we covered this back in February, and I'm going to show you where we covered in case you want to go look at that. But the Pope is working in two, way, two, two specific areas. First, he's trying to bring the ecumenical movement of Christianity itself, bring all the Protestants back home to the mother church, as they, as they, they say it. And you might have seen the signs across the country. You might have even seen some commercials on TV. They're saying, come home. And what they're talking about is they're the mother church, bringing in all the harlots, as the Bible calls them, back to the mother church. Now, this is just in Christianity. But for the Pope to accomplish what the Bible needs to accomplish, it has to do one more thing. It has to bring in all faiths. It, It can't be just Christianity. 
He has to be a world ruler. So what he has to do is find a way to bring in all faiths. So that's what's going on right now. This is the second leg of the movement of the Pope to rise up to see the Holy Roman revival begin to take place before the return of Jesus Christ. So now, with that said, let's see this. August 22nd, this is from LifeSite News. It says, a multi-faith higher committee was announced this week to implement the human fraternity. And I love the way they document the human fraternity. You know, we just like a, like a, a club in, in college. You know, we're a sorority. You're a fraternity. We're all just going to be able to get along one right after another, which is a document signed by the Pope Francis and the Grand Imam in February. Now, we covered that. So what I did today is I brought in two things that we, we brought out. You see, on February 15th, this is the Pope in the UAE. Now, this is what this article is referring to. They got together in February, and we announced what they were doing is signing this document. Now, what they're doing here on, February, on uh, August 22nd is now they're formulating a committee to put into play what was done in February 15th. Then the next week, February 22nd, we brought in the Pope was in Morocco showing how they're trying to bring Christians with Muslims, Chrislam, Chrislam. And that's unbelievable when you see how the Christians are being slaughtered in many of these uh, Muslim nations where the Christianity is almost non-existent now. So he's out trying to pull all this together to try to make it all work. So here, here's what we reported on back in February. One world religion. This is a historic pledge. The Pope and the Grand Imam of Al-Hazar has signed a historical declaration of fraternity calling for peace between nations, religions, and races in front of the global audience of religious leaders from Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and other faiths. Now, it's interesting when you see this. Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. These three are the mainstay of the religions in the world. It's kind of interesting when, when you see in, in Revelation and Matthew, it talks about this massive earthquake that's going to take place at the return or just before the return of Jesus Christ. And Jerusalem is broken into three pieces. It's interesting when you see that. It's, it's not that it's possible that God's actually going to divide what the Pope's trying to put together. It's interesting. I just wanted to bring that out in case you're not aware of what's taking place here. So now, I brought these up so that in case you missed that program, those two programs, you can go back to see what we had to say about that and how we're building on what's been going on, how God is leading our program to bring you important issues as they come out that pertain to prophecy and end time. So today is just one more of those pieces that goes into a puzzle that gives us a clearer picture of what's actually taking place. So now, let's getting back to this August 22nd. So it's stated, this is the, this is the uh, committee that's going together. So it's stated, among other things, that a pluralism and diversity of religions is willed by God. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not the way God reads in his holy scripture. God says, this is the way walk ye in it. It doesn't allow you to take everybody away, the way they walk and put them all together and then we can make it work. In fact, how can a house stand that is divided? The Bible says that also. It's all a part of this, the 2030 agenda. This is the push that the Pope has been working on to bring to this world. And it's interesting when you see this. Satan says he, has, he knows he has but a short time. Is it possible that what we're looking at is Satan knowing he has a short time? That he's pushing for this to get it all done before it happens? What we're looking at is peace, justice, and institutions, the partnershiping the goals, and the sustaining development goals. All of these are brought in for the green and bringing all the religions in the world to just get along. And who's going to make it and to do that? It's going to be the Pope, and it's all going to be under him. So now, <coughs> with that, let's move on now to one more piece of a puzzle. I believe it or not, this helps tie in to what we just talked about with the Pope, because there's got to be a catalyst for this to work. People just don't give up what they have and to get along with one another. It hasn't worked for 6,000 years, and it will not work today unless there's a catalyst that brings them all together. So you probably heard about this in the news, the Amazon rainforest and the fires that's taking place. So before we cover the fires, 
I'm going to give you this little background, Rainforest 101 it's called, a little video. I believe it's National Geographic who brought this out. And of course, it's National Geographic. It's going to have something about uh, <laughs> evolution. <laughs> so if it's a little bit of evolution in there, it's, that's just where they're coming from. But it does have a historical value of the rainforest. Let's play that video. I'll be right back. Shrouded in a blanket of clouds, they awaken. Their canopies of green glitter in the sun. Their wildlife start to slither, chirp, and growl. And one of the planet's richest ecosystems comes to life. Rainforests are the oldest living ecosystems on the planet. Some can trace their origins to over 70 million years ago, back to a time when dinosaurs still roamed the Earth. While the giant reptiles have disappeared, rainforests continue to thrive, growing on every continent except Antarctica. Two types of rainforests are scattered across the globe, temperate and tropical. Temperate rainforests are mainly found in the mid-latitudes, often near cooler, coastal, mountainous regions. Tropical rainforests are primarily located in warmer climates, between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. As their names imply, temperate and tropical rainforests are the wettest forests on Earth, receiving up to about 33 feet of rain per year. This precipitation plays a critical role in creating an exceptionally lush and biologically diverse habitat. While rainforests only make up about 6% of the Earth's surface area, they are home to over half of the world's plant and animal species. This biodiversity creates benefits that extend far beyond the rainforest boundaries. Rainforest plants produce an assortment of food items in addition to ingredients useful in everyday products and medicines. In fact, an estimated 70% of the plants used in cancer treatments are only found in rainforests. On an even larger scale, rainforests help to stabilize the planet's climate. Its lush green vegetation regulate global temperatures by absorbing massive amounts of radiation from the sun. They also absorb vast amounts of carbon dioxide and convert them into oxygen, about 40% of the planet's breathable air. Over the past few centuries, rainforests have disappeared at an alarming rate. Factors such as economic inequalities, human development, and demand for natural resources have fueled the deforestation of these rich ecosystems. At the current rate, rainforests, which have survived for over 70 million years, may completely disappear within the next century. But through educational campaigns, sustainable logging practices, and cooperation with local communities, deforestation may begin to slow down, helping preserve rainforests for many generations to come. Well, there you have a background on the rainforests and, and how they affect the world. So now, let's take that same story now. Let's look at what's going on in some of the news that's been taking place. See how this applies to what's going on with the Pope, the climate change, and all the problems that are developing. So now, let's talk about the, the rainforest, and we're going to specifically talk about Brazil and the burning that's taking place there. What National Ge Geographic brought out was the whole uh, system across the earth of the rainforest, not just in Brazil, but across the whole planet. So that's why their figures are going to be a little different from the news story that you're going to see here. But the effects of what they're talking about is real and what's taking place here in Brazil. So now, let's begin with this. This year, there are over 72,000 fires in the Brazilian Amazon so far this year. That is up 84% from 2018. 2018 was up from 2017. So the, the fires are growing exponentially year after year after year, partly by man, partly by nature. So now, uh, of August 22nd, right now, 
there are still 2,500 active fires across Brazil. So now this is brought an alarm because of the smoke and the amount of fires that has brought an alarm around the world, all right? This also affects North America. Now, what's not shown here is that the effects of Brazil is that at certain times of the year, with the movement of the, the airflow of, of the world itself, you'll see it move to the north, which brings moisture into the growing portions of this nation, which is important, and people are seeing that now. What else they didn't bring out, surprisingly, I saw this a couple years ago, is this Brazilian forest in its richness actually depends on Africa and the amount of dust that comes across out of Africa at certain times of the year, which creates a canopy and holds the moisture in to the Brazilian rainforest. Believe it or not, that's what actually takes place. We're looking at that today where the drier air that would come over with the dust in it and hold this canopy over Brazil to keep the moisture in and keep it growing is moved slightly north is actually helping keep down hurricanes from growing because it's a drier, more stable air. And the moisture in, in the, uh, the waters can't grow and it's been protecting <laughs> the United States right now because of the, uh, the dry flow. So now, getting back to this, but all everything's interacting with one another is what I'm trying to bring out. So the Amazon, so how does the Amazon fires deforestation affect the United States and the Midwest? These are actually articles that are being brought out that are actual real events that are taking place. The Amazon is what they're, they're calling a weather engine and studies show that further deforestation has the ability to destabilize the rainfall patterns that threaten food production, particularly here in America. Growing global protesting, all right? So this is what's going on now. Because of this, the climate change and the way people are talking about what's happening around the world, now they're worried that 20% of the world's oxygen is being depleted because of these fires, which is bringing about anger and protesting. Now, what did we say the Pope needed to put his thing into place? A catalyst. So now, now what we're looking at, and this is why I say this is a next stage of growing uh, the, the end time return of Jesus Christ for the Pope to be able to stake his claim on the world control. So now here's the rainforest that we're looking at. And this is across the middle portion that we looked at in that video of what's taking place. The impact, it says, of the deforestation could in many continental interiors dwarf the impacts of climate change. So as they're afraid of climate change, it has just escalated now because the fire here is going to make it even greater problem in the areas where we need food to sustain life. So what does that do? It's creating fear. It's creating fear and panic is growing around the world. So I got a video here, just a little short video. It's about two minutes long, showing you some of the concern and listen to the rhetoric that's in it and how, how damaging this begins to sound. Let's play that video. It's still burning. For weeks now, the Amazon rainforest, one of Earth's most valuable resources, has been ravaged by fires, prompting protests in Brazil and around the world. From Mexico City to Berlin to Paris and London. Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro announcing he'll send in the military to fight the fires. But environmentalists blame his policies for encouraging the destruction, a claim he denies. Bolsonaro is under growing pressure from Europe to act. French President Emmanuel Macron, today hosting the G7 summit, accused him of not doing enough and threatened to scrap a huge trade deal between the European Union and South America. Finland is calling on the EU to consider banning Brazilian beef imports. President Trump taking a different tone, tweeting, just spoke with President Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil. Our future trade prospects are very exciting and our relationship is strong, perhaps stronger than ever before. The Amazon is home to 3 million plant and animal species, and the rainforest produces 20% of the Earth's oxygen, helping to slow global warming by absorbing millions of tons of carbon emissions each year. A 
role now under threat. So you hear the language and the threats. They're threatening that they're not going to trade with them, they're beef, we're not going to buy you beef, we're not going to work with you. All of this dealing around the global because of the fear of what's happening to our planet. Now, Emmanuel Macron, the French president, said this, our house is burning literally in the Amazon rainforest. The lungs, which produce 20% of our planet's oxygen, is on fire. It's an international crisis. Members of the G7 submit, let's discuss this emergency in first order in two days. So as the G7 got together, one of the things they wanted to talk about was this forest fire and how it's affecting the world. Now, the, 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 the rhetoric, and I'm calling it rhetoric because it's not all documented to be true. This is Dr. Jonathan Foley. In case you don't know who he is, he's the executive project of what's called Project Drawdown. So it's, it's his job in the, in the institute that he runs is to find ways to help reduce climate problems in this globe. So he is he's one of the leaders and in the environmental scene of what's going on, he says global environmental scientists, writer, speaker, focus on the solutions, and this is his job. One of the things he said is this, if anybody would be claiming all of this, it would be him. But here's what he wrote. Despite the widespread claim the Amazon doesn't produce 20% of the world's oxygen, it's more like 6% plus or minus is what he's trying to say. He's got a lot of things in support of what everybody was saying, but he's trying to bring the rhetoric down to a manageable level to bring out the actual truth. And they're not listening to him of what he's trying to say. So if you want to find out some more, you can go to Project Drawdown and you'll find out about some of the things who are actually taking place as far as climate goes. So the rainforest is now telling us they're reaching a tipping point. Is that true? All right. In a 2040 study, this again brings out the alarm of what's taking place. In the 2014 study, in the, in the Journal of Nat Nature Climate Change, found that the complete Amazon deforestation would reduce, reduce rainfall in the United States, Midwest, Northwest, and parts of the South during the agricultural season. And that is true. That actually takes place. That's because cutting down trees and moisture would cool the air lost and the warmer air would rise to the upper atmosphere, creating ripples that flow outward and can alter the climate and other reasons. This could be part of the reason we're seeing some of the changes taking place in the Midwest and some of the droughts and some of the things that we've seen changing over the last couple years. Now, with all of that being said, now let's get into a Nuggets portion of that. We laid the, we laid the Pope out who's trying to put everybody together. We laid out that there has to be a a catalyst. We're saying that this is the beginning of a catalyst, and we've been talking about climate change. So what's the next thing that has to be done? The herd mentality. We began talking about that as early as February 23rd, 2018. That's a year and a half ago. If what's going to be beginning to take place is taking the mindset of the people around the world and bringing them to the herd mentality and bringing in the fear of getting everybody herded together to accomplish what they want to accomplish. Now, the fire now, the forest fires in Brazil, as I said, is reaching a next level of growth. So this is lifting the herd mentality to a global level. How's it doing that? The issue of global warming has now found the catalyst to rally around and if needed to fight and even kill for, if needed to save mankind. So you've seen the president of France saying, our house is burning, this is a real problem, we need to fix this. So what does that do to the people? It herds them into the mentality and say, if we don't do something soon, we're not gonna be here. So you're seeing the rallies around the world of these, these younger people thinking they're not gonna have a future. So if they don't have a future, it's just like pre-World War II in Germany. It's the Jews who have the problem. So it's those who are not a part of climate change are the ones creating the problem. We have to get rid of them. Look what Jesus said. This is the mindset that eventually we'll get to. It will get to it because this is the word of Jesus Christ. This is coming out of John 16, verse 2. It says, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he's doing God a service. So people are going to be raised to the state of the emotion. It will begin with physical uh, uh, confrontation, eventual battles, and even see maybe nation fighting against nation to protect themselves going forward. So now, these hostilities, are they reaching a tipping point also? All right, at some point, 
It has to go beyond rhetoric to becoming physical. Are we there yet, all right? Let me just give you one example, because we're not quite there yet, but it's coming. I want to give you just one example today of showing you how the emotion in people's minds is beginning to be accepted by the herd mentality. This is David Koch, who billionaire who fueled the right wing movement, wing movement, died at 79. All right, so now, I don't know if you like him, you don't like him, I don't really know much about him, so I'm not even talking about him as pro con. Forget about that. I'm talking about what's coming biblically. So I'm using an example of someone that the left hates, literally hates him. And so what does that take you? Watch this. He's a man about, about town philanthropist, it said. He and his brother Charles ran a business colossus with furthering the libertarian agenda that reshaped American politics. So now he dies. Hollywood celebrates David Co Coach, I think it's Coke, death, in hopes his brother dies soon. These are headlines. This is, this is accepted in the herd mentality. So now, Hollywood wasted no time on Friday to mock and even cheer the death of billionaire philanthropist David Koch, with some hoping that his brother, Charles, also meets his demise. Now, that didn't used to be, wasn't even printable. It wasn't accepted. Even, it doesn't matter which side of the coin you stand on. That was never accepted as being an acceptable part of print. So here's some quotes. Bette Midler, so he, he, she tweeted, Charles Coat had died instead of David. She says, I'm sorry to give false hope. Wow. Yes, it was just wishful thinking as we watched the Amazon rainforest burning. You see the connection? The hatred is that while they're doing this, our world's dying. I'm glad he's gone. I hope his brother goes too. John Cusack, tr truly a legacy of horror. He died as far as rage from the Amazon to the Arctic. Again, the hatred drawn into what? Climate. Here's another one. Bradley Whitford. You can't take it with you. You can, however, destroy the planet with democracy, with your unspeakable greed. Again, climate. So they have a catalyst now to rally around. And then one more. This is a big one that everybody knows. This is Bill Mayer, who's on TV. He says, I hope the end was painful. This is, this is his quote. He and his brother have done more than anybody to fund climate science deniers for decades. So F him. The Amazon is burning up. I'm glad he's dead. I hope the end was painful. He said that live on TV. And it's accepted. No one disclaims any of this. Now they have a reason to rally, a just cause, and a reason to fuel the hatred. What I'm telling you is that it will go from this to physical down the road. So what I'm doing today is I'm bringing you the next step of the herd mentality rising up and showing you now that while the world is talking about the fire and the climate, I'm showing you from the Nuggets portion, from the biblical portion of what and where people are heading to before the return of Jesus Christ. Satan's next step of destruction, creating the life <clears throat> excuse me, the life and death need for survival, because that's what's coming. As global conditions deteriorate, the emotion of survival of mankind will continually grow. And how do we know that? Because of Revelation. Look what happens in Revelation. We look at the first four seals. Have you looked at them lately? I'm talking about that in the day of the Lord, revisit it again. In fact, this tomorrow on the program, we're doing part two on the day of the Lord, revisit it. God willing, we get that out there. Because these are the things that will take place before the return of Jesus Christ. Look what it says in verse 4. And power was given them over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the earth. So before we even get into the persecution of God's saints, the first four seals, we see the pestilence, we see the earthquake, we'll see, we see famine, we'll see death. That's going to be over a fourth part of the earth. If you don't believe that that's going to bring about self-preservation, then you're kidding yourself. But all of these things will be taking place before the return of Jesus Christ. What we're looking at now is a foundation or a root, the basics that will be building on that's going to give the Pope what he needs 
to rally this world around with his charisma to save mankind from destroying itself. The anti-type Christ, because Jesus Christ is the only one that can do that. So now, the, this is the leading up to the seals. All right? This is Leviticus 18, verses 26 through 28. What does the Bible tell us about the land and what we're looking at? It says, You shall therefore keep my statutes, my judgments. You shall not commit any of these abominations, either any of your own nation or any stranger who dwells among you. For all of these abominations the men of the land have done who were before you, and thus the land is defiled. So that's what we're looking at right now. We're looking at mankind just destroying this planet. Verse 28, look what it says in verse 28. This is important. Lest the land vomit you out. The land itself is going to vomit us out. Also, that says when, uh, when you defile it, as it has vomited the nations that went before you. So we've been covering how the land itself is in waiting in travail for the return of Jesus Christ. So you're looking at the growing of the land of taking place that's going to vomit mankind off this planet. Even the plants, the land, the, the creatures that are in it, all work in a system that God designed to work in harmony and peace and to be rich and abundant. And we're not seeing that anymore. The earth is sick. It's, 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 it needs to be mended. It needs to be healed. And Jesus Christ is coming back. And it's going to give it its rest for a thousand years to return it back to the way that it was when mankind was created. Look what Jesus says in, in connection with that. There will be wars and rumors of wars, famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. These are only the beginning of sorrows. So with the foundation, you're looking at what I showed you today. Jesus is saying it's going to come and it's going to get worse, but that is only the beginning. And this is why I told you today, we're at the foundation. We're at the tipping point. It's getting ready to go over the edge. Look what it said in verse 9, Matthew. And they will deliver you up to tribulation and to kill you. And you will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, love of many will wax cold. In these three, four verses, I'm sorry, here, these four verses, I can build an entire sermon around what's coming, the condition, and the mindset of mankind before the return of Jesus Christ. If we look at this lawlessness, if we go out to California, what we've been talking about, it's all lawlessness. We're talking about the, the refugees who are sneaking in illegally, coming into the country. It's lawlessness. We look at what's taking place in the murder of Christians across the world. It's lawlessness. And the love of many will wax cold. And he's talking about even those in your own home that you won't agree with, who doesn't agree with what you have to say. Many in the future will find themselves hated even in their own homes. What I'm trying to show you today is step by step, here a little, there a little, Satan is bringing this world to destruction around us. And he's created the lie that everyone's buying of who's at fault for doing it all. And so what we're bringing you today is the next step of this global problem that's developing in the fires in the Brazil and Amazon is just one of those little catalysts that's going to pull everybody together to bring down humanity. All right, let's take a break. That's some pretty serious stuff. So now, let's take a break. We're going to talk about Labor Day in the video here. We're going to a little break section. So when we come back, we're going to be talking about the appointed time, part two. But in the meantime, let's take a break and look at this History Channel video on Labor Day, and I'll be right back. The Industrial Revolution modernized the United States and Canada during the 19th century. As people enjoyed steady employment, they compromised their rights in the workplace. Longer work hours and pay cuts were imposed. U.S. labor groups began protecting themselves by unionizing. In Canada, unions were illegal. Until 1872, when thousands of Ottawa laborers marched to Prime Minister John McDonald's home. That year, Canada wiped the anti-union law from its books 
and the march became an annual Canadian tradition. In 1882, Toronto labor officials invited an American union leader, Peter J. McGuire, to Toronto's labor celebrations. McGuire was so impressed that he suggested a workers' parade to New York City's Central Labor Union. He chose September 5th as the date because it filled the long void between July 4th and Thanksgiving. Coincidentally, that same year, a machinist from Patterson, New Jersey, Matthew McGuire, also proposed a laborer's celebration. On Tuesday, September 5, 1882, thousands of New York City laborers marched from City Hall to Union Square. They gathered in Reservoir Park for an afternoon of picnics, concerts, and speeches rallying for an eight-hour workday. Two years later, the Central Labor Union moved the parade to the first Monday in September. They also encouraged all U.S. cities to follow New York's lead and march for the working man's holiday. For many, the choice was to either spend the day at work or march without pay. That began to change when Oregon became the first state to legalize the Labor Day holiday in 1887. Other states, including New York, soon followed. It took a political disaster to put Labor Day on the national calendar. In 1894, railway workers in Pullman, Illinois went on strike to protest wage cuts. President Grover Cleveland faced pressure to end the demonstrations and sent 12,000 federal troops to break the strike. Violence erupted. Two strikers were killed and Cleveland's harsh methods made headlines. In an attempt to appease the nation's workers, he signed a bill to make Labor Day a federal holiday. Cleveland still lost that year's election. America's workers continued to gain power through the 1950s when over a third of all labor forces were unionized. Labor Day had become a time to rally workers for safer conditions, fair pay, and benefits. But in the second half of the 20th century, the U.S. labor force diminished. Many factories closed. Jobs were outsourced to other countries. Today, workers still parade through blue-collar neighborhoods on Labor Day, and speeches unite the ever-dwindling labor force. But the day's true call has quieted. For now, most Americans leisurely enjoy the holiday as summer's last bow. Welcome back. Well, that's where Labor Day came from. So if you're, in, you're off this coming Monday, enjoying the time with your family, you have a little background of where it came from. All right, let's get back to our program now. It's something uh, a little less traumatic than the first half of our program. And I really, those kind of programs when you got to bring out the importance of what we brought out today. I mean, it's not pleasant to talk about even much as it is to hear, but they need to be, they, these things need to be said and they need to be talked about. And you need to share that with as many people as you can. So whatever you can do to help share the Word of God and take this program, simply forward it to a friend. And uh, hopefully that God will call them to understanding what you understand today. So now, the appointed time, part two. We ended our program last week with a question. And this was, this was the slide right here where we ended it up. And I'm going to come back to that slide in just a second. But this was the question. And this is talking about the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. And God uses in Exodus when they came out, it says, 430 years. It says, to the self-same day. It says, to the very day. Why is that important? What is that telling us? And what did God have in plan when he laid all this out before? So let's answer that question today. All right, so now, going on. This is where it picks up the story from. Genesis 15, verses 13 and 14. So he said to Abram, this is before God changed his name to Abraham, Know of a surety that your seed will be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and they shall serve them and shall afflict them four hundred years. Now this was before there was an Isaac, there was a Jacob, there was an Israel, there was four, if any of that. This is what God was telling Abram is going to happen when he brings him to a land. He says, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they will come out with great substance. All right, so that's the prophecy of going into captivity and coming out of captivity. So that's found in Genesis 15, verses 13 and 14. So now let's remember what God says. This is in Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. This is talking about the prophesied salvation of Israel, remember? But now we're going to pull in two parts of the story. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. He says this, So remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else, and I am God, there is none like me. 
declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. That's what you're looking at in Genesis. So what Isaiah has says is what God actually did. He has declared the end from the beginning. Now this is talking about mankind in general in the return of the whole 7,000 years. In specific, they were talking to Abram about a specific event that leads up to the, the, the entire 7,000 years. It's talking about the time of Israel going into captivity before it became known as Israel and the 12 tribes. The second thing that pulls together, Genesis 1, verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament. And God said, in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now, this is a scripture that the church in general has kind of just avoided. Over the years, it was like it was off limits. We don't want to talk about the signs and seasons in the heavens because that's what Satan created. Well, so did God. And Satan is the great counterfeiter. We need to remember that. So whatever God does, Satan counterfeits. So what did he counterfeit here? So what, what Satan has done, he's taken what God told us to do. He says, look at the firmament. He says, I'm putting them out there for signs and for seasons. So Satan creates this counterfeit religion around the worship of the sun, the moon, and the stars. And he creates the counterfeit and then tells you, don't look at the counterfeit. Why? Because that's where God told you to look. And when did he do it? What Isaiah said? From the beginning of time. He told you what's going to happen from the beginning. What else do we have that we can look at that's still in existence from the beginning of time? The sun, the moon, and the stars. And that's why, that's why Satan created the counterfeit religion. He said, don't do that. So the church has looked at the counterfeit religion and said, no, you don't look at any of that. Thus, we don't read the signs and the seasons. All right? So that's where we've missed the boat. So now, using that information now, let's go through and answer the question. All right, so now, what are signs? The, the Hebrew word for signs and the Hebrew word for seasons. All right, the Hebrew word for signs means a flag, a signal, or a beacon, which is interesting because God says he put the lights in the firmament in the heaven, the sun, the moon, and the stars, as a flag, a signal, and a beacon. So if you want to have a sign, <coughs> excuse me, he's, God says, I put them out there for you. So the, the seasons is what? The same word season is translated as appointed times. It means the, the, the moim, the, the appointed time. You see that around the holy days. It's you always used the appointed times around holy days or God's appointed time for salvation. All right? You'll see that written from the beginning of time. Look at Leviticus 23, verse 4. So these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. That seasons is also written in the New King James Version as appointed time. So when you look at the seasons, God's plan of salvation is built around his holy day seasons. All right, so now, when we're looking at this again, we have a sign, a flag, a signal, or a beacon that something's going to be taking place around his holy day season. So what was written from the beginning of time that we're looking at is going to be taking place in its season? All right. That's how we answer this question of 430 years. So they left Egypt, Israel left Egypt at the appointed time. Now there's a slide that we had earlier, Genesis 15, verses 13 and 14. So now let's look at Exodus 12, 40 and 41. Verse 40. So now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. But God told Abram he'd be 400 years. It's not a contradiction. He's talking about two different points of view of the same event. Let me show you. And so, and it came to pass at the end of 430 years, even the self same day. You know, for years when I was in, be reading and studying this in, in a, my series of Exodus, I used to always wonder, why would he say the self same day? It's because what I showed you before, the season at the appointed time. So it had to be when they came out which is the former pointing to the latter, all right? It's the type pointing to the anti-type. What the Israelites did, they were the type. 
So they had to come out on the self same day, which would be the antitype. So what is that? Why 430 years? What is God showing us about this appointed time? So now, with all that background, now we're ready to answer the question. So now, let's go to the question here. Declaring the end from the beginning, from the ancient times, things that are not yet. How does God do that? And the other part of the question was, I mean, the other part of the statement at the beginning here was Genesis 1.14 about the signs and the seasons. So to answer the question, we use scripture now to define what it is we're looking for to answer the question. So now, here's our, here's our beginning of the chart, Genesis 1.14. So God wrote in the heavens, in the sun, the moon, and the stars, from the beginning of creation, what was going to take place at the end of creation. Now, we're told here in, uh, in, in Exodus, it would be with the signs and the seasons to the appointed self same day. So let's go look at this. All right, there's the scripture here that they would be afflicted for 400 years. So what are we looking at here? So this is the prophesied captivity of uh, the children of Israel. In type, Israel is held in bondage, which is type of Egypt, which is Pharaoh, which is the type of Satan. So what God was showing us, the 400 years would be the 4,000 years until the time that Christ would be born. So what are we looking at here? Right there, the 400 years, God shows us in Bible type. God uses a day as a year. You see that in Ezekiel and in Numbers. And also 2 Peter tells us a day as a thousand years. So when you put that together, you have the 400 years or the 4,000 years that mankind would be in bondage from the time Adam sinned till Christ came. All right, so Christ came around the zero, which is actually like 3 B.C., 4 B.C., depending on how you calculate the timing of those events. So what we're looking at here is this. This would be the 400 or the 400 years, being the 4,000 years. Mankind is in bondage until Christ comes back. And when this, right here it says 430 years, right? So now we can look at this. The only way to come out of bondage and sin is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And how old was he when he died and began his ministry? He was 33 and a half years old when he died. He began his ministry when he was 30 years old. Born just before the zero, so when he died, it was 430 years to the self-same day. The self-same day was in the appointed time. The Moib that means the season. Here, look what it says here. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even to the self-same day. What day was he crucified? Passover. That was the appointed time. The appointed time of the years of mankind. The appointed time of the seasons took place to 430 years. All right, so it was the exact same, self-same day. Look at Christ, look at 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So why 430 years? It represented the 430 or 4,000 years and then the 30 years when Christ would be crucified on the self-same day. When did they come out? They came out on the night to be much observed right after the Passover. When, when they, they killed the lamb, they came out on the 15th day. Same way with mankind. All of this, mankind, was in bondage in the type of Egypt that that took place. So that takes care of the season. All right, so we, we have proved now from the Bible that what was being taught there, why God gave that to us, because God was showing us how long mankind would be and how long it was going to be from the beginning of time till mankind came out of bondage at the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But now we get something else here. Signs. See, there's got to be signs and season. So now, Jesus definitely fulfilled the season portion, but what are the signs? Remember, God declared these things from the beginning. So now, this is, this is answered. This is a new question. What are the signs? How did they know from the beginning what the signs would be? Well, I'm not going to tell you that today. You're going to have to tune in next week to get that answer. Just like we answered that this week, we'll answer that one next week. So tell your friends about it. Stay tuned, because that's going to even be more exciting than this. All right, that's our program for today. All right, let's go to the home office, see what we have here at the home office. DVDs in the mail this week. 
This is touching eternity. This is a sermon I did not too long ago. Uh, uh, this is at, at the point of what time touches eternity. And this is from Chuck Hunt Jr., a uh, minister up in Michigan. And it's a hard look inside. Then in the mail, we put in the mail the newsletter for this month. How many more years do we have? Well, we don't really know, do we? But we're going to talk about that in offering the video of the Day of the Lord Revisited. And I'll be doing part two, as I mentioned earlier, tomorrow in the program. So if you don't have services and anywhere to go tomorrow, we broadcast live right here in Gretna. Tune in at 1 o'clock Central, 2 o'clock Eastern Time, and take, pay attention to the Day of the Lord Revisited. You're going to be really, you're going to find it very informative. So those are in the mail this past week. Well, that's it. That's our program for today. I want to close with something and just say that with all boldness and confidence that what I bring you each and every week, that's nothing that you need to be afraid of, that you need to look to Jesus Christ and thank Him for all that information He shares with us that you can share with others because with the boldness and the confidence of Jesus Christ, when these things take place, we need to lift our heads high and know that Jesus Christ is coming back. And we don't need to be frightened. We need to, we need to be bold and share with this with everybody. And the fact that He's sharing this information should give you the confidence that you're in the hands of your Creator and your elder brother, Jesus Christ. Have a great Labor Day till next week. God be with you. And don't forget to share this with everybody you know. They're going to love you for it. Or not. Till next week, God be with you.